So this panel is Coded Communications, Digital Weaving as Artistic Technology. The organizers are Gabe Duggan and Janie Woodbridge. Uh, the panelists in this order are Gabe Duggan, Janie Woodbridge, Robin Haller, and Kate Narker. And this panel addresses the, um, I'm just gonna read a couple details on this. As physical experiences become increasingly digitized, hand-controlled digital jacquard looms such as the TC1 and TC2 are particularly suited to address critical contemporary issues. In this panel, four artists present their studio practices, which utilize this technology to develop contemporary work. The digital weaving processes and technologies practiced by artists Duggan, Haller, Narker, and Woodbridge are historically and functionally intermeshed. As with other digital fabrication processes, digital data, the pixel, is rendered in physical space through the medium. A unique characteristic of this process, however, is an additional transmitter of this data, the human body. In this process, ancient craft and digital organization are at work simultaneously as the artist's hands guide both file design and physical translation. To consider at the same time that the very pixels used by the, to build these works are emulations of their technological predecessors, thread on binary loom systems, introduces timely pertinence to the evolving fusion of digital, physical life and perception. And I will hand it over to Janie. I'm gonna introduce Gabe Duggan and so, um, Gabe Duggan is an assistant professor at East Carolina University and has taught at the University of North Texas, Georgia State University, and North Carolina State University. Their work has been supported by the NC Arts Council, Art on the Atlanta Beltline, Vignette Art Fair and Residencies at the Musk Ox Farm, Governor's Island Art Fair, Rob Dunlab, and the Cooler Ranch. Here's Gabe. Thanks, Janie. Um, I guess before I get, jump into presenter mode, I wanna remind everybody for the panel uh, as the chair, Please use the question and answer feature in Zoom and the chat feature will be mostly just some kind of side noise. If you have a question for the panelists, we will be addressing those at the end after everybody has presented. Please be sure to use the question and answer feature in Zoom. Be sure to also include the panelist name and um, for who you have the question. And if we don't get to all the questions in time, please feel free to refer back to the um, to the crowd app and then also uh, I believe TSA has a few different options for continuing conversations. So I'm Gabe Duggan and I am presenting to you today uh, Glitch Metaphors Dysfunction in Hand Woven Digital Jacquard. Um, I am on Moratok and Ska Ue Tuscarora land in eastern North Carolina right now. So let's start with some definitions. This is not digital, this is not weaving. This is suspension, tension, order of chaos, a weaver's strategies. It is digital at every inherently, inevitably binary intersection through space, almost tyrannical in its simple rule that at every meeting there can and must only always ever be one on top, only one winner, cut and dry. It is also digital in its only form of existence. Kelly, the inefficiencies of a network, all that redundancy and ricocheting vectors, things going from there to here and back just to get across the street encompasses imperfection rather than ejecting it. A network nurtures small failures in order that large failures don't happen as often. It is its capacity to hold error rather than scuttle it that makes the distributed being fertile ground for learning, adaptation, and evolution. Oscillating between technologies, hand and machine, one learns how to challenge, one, challenge and work with one based on experiences of the other. It would help to define technologies here. For our purposes here, let's say that technology is anything between the thought and material, making real, IRL. Between can be a hurdle or conduit. Bridges and walls both define between. Under this definition falls digital data, machines, the hand, body, 
and interference data such as memories, aches, and pleasure. Gibson. This costs a lot, she said, extending her right hand as though it held an invisible fruit. Five blades slid out, then retracted smoothly. Cost to go to Chiba, cost to get the surgery, cost to have them jack your system up so that you don't have the ref so you'll have the reflections to go with the gear. You know how I got the money when I was starting out here? Here, not here, but a place like it in the sprawl. Joke to start off with because once they plant the cutout chip, it seems like free money. Wake up sore sometimes, but that's it. Renting the goods is all. You aren't in when it's happening. House has software for whatever a customer wants to pay for. She cracked her knuckles. Fine, I was getting my money. Trouble was the cutout and the circuitry the Chiba clinics put in were not compatible. So work time started bleeding in and I could remember it. Does symmetry reflect not just self, but the binary at its core? Is its duplicitous mirror holding, in its duplicitous mirror holding, are these compositions inherently dichotomous? Do these feed a larger dichotomy? Some technologies just are just by enough. Dancing a three-legged waltz with function, dysfunction, and collaborator. This graceful rhythmic falling between half on, half off, and third space balances momentarily just enough to hold law and freedom, unenforced law and nature's anarchy within one piece. We fuse. The, world sp the words spill out from code bound by pixel reliant on thread built from plants that have bent themselves to our species insa insatiability, a desire that rendered logical, kidnapping, enslaving, country, country and culture splitting, and refounding on scar material alone. And yet regardless of the blood we wipe on this plant or how we spin it disposable, it grows, it reseeds, it gets preyed, by, preyed on by bull weevils, beyond our myopic needs, desires, and gaze. Kimmerer, that is the fundamental nature of gifts. They move and their value increases with their passage. The fields made a gift of berries to us and we made a gift of them to our parent. The more something is shared, the greater its value becomes. In material fact, strawberries belong only to themselves. The exchange relationships we choose to determine whether we share them as a common gift or sell them as a private commodity. A great deal rests on that choice. For the greater part of human history and in places in the world today, common resources were the rule. But some invented a different story, a social construct in which everything is a commodity to be bought and sold. The market economy story has spread like wildfire with uneven results for human well-being and devastation for the natural world. But it is just a story we have told ourselves and we are free to tell another one, to reclaim the old one. My work on the TC1 digital jacquard loom has, by, has primarily been tethered to one specific machine with which I have shared a personal past and future for just over a decade. This particular machine tra machine's trajectory echoes the precarity some people and practices are, experiment are experiencing within dominant institutions. Through this technology, I have built and negated tension, challenging a broad range of power dynamics. This tension pulsates through space into surrounding bodies through sound waves. Tension builds, destroys, Tension gives, holds. What is this tension? What's to be done with all this tension? It brings its own decay, demise. It turns on itself, a merciless critical lens, a too accurate scalpel. What are its origins? Where does it lead or point us to? In the practice of draping, rapings 
or uh, wrinkles always point to the problem. When I talk to the machine, who am I talking to? Who is there? Where do these prayers go? No one is listening, and yet I continue talking. Kelly, whereas the atom represents clean simplicity, the net channels the messy power of complexity. When we turn it in on itself, what comes out the other end? How many self-references can we make until we fully disintegrate? Half-life, parabolic, asymptotic, haraway. Cyborgs are not reverent. They do not remember the cosmos. The main trouble with cyborgs is that they are illegitimate offspring, but illegitimate offspring spring are often exceedingly unfaithful to their origins. What if we just click print? Why not just click print? Let's invite the grid to receive its replica. And efficiencies are the colleagues that closed the door to your office behind them on your first day, who rapid fire email asking if you're on campus, can you meet up? Who email repeatedly after 1 a.m. about some unsolicited music video? The senior colleague that intoxicatedly accost at a restaurant where you went to catch up on articles or who yells without ceasing at another in a meeting the supervisor who wishes you a relaxing vacation after you explain that the connection at your residency is slim. This residency, which is the main line of your research, in which you are staying in a chicken coop amidst piles of compost and ag equipment so that you can wake up and sweat in the field all day, every day, pushing up against the question, do you have enough time to accomplish what you came to do? Inefficiencies are the mentors who bind you in various ways, physically, mentally, so that they can ignore your repeated no's. But these are just the seed moments of inefficiencies that grow into hours of tiptoeing around labyrinths, of missing steps, of cashing in on pro bono consultation from family and friends and paid counsel too, of self prescribing prescribing exercise and the occasional frivolous purchase to steal yourself back into the present of doing the endless invisible homework, trying to track down what could possibly be advised to your own mentees that are in line to inherit all of this. What hope could possibly remain? All these hours taking you away from sleep, the very work itself, from health and self and others, Van der Kolk. In order to know who we are, to have an identity, we must know, or at least feel that we know, what is and what was real. Erasing awareness and cultivating denial are often essential to survival, he says. Is this a tool that is resilient, adaptable, like you or me enough to hold inefficiencies and not fall apart? What if we feed it itself, re-input re previously processed input? Kelly, for each step we push our machines toward the collective, we move them toward life. And with each step away from the clock, our contraptions lose the cold, fast, opti optimal in efficiencies of machines. Most tasks will balance some control for adaptability. And so the apparatus that does the best job will be some cyborgian hybrid of part clock, part swarm. And what is the function of function? What is the use in a non-functional object? an object whose ones 
whose one function is to receive, absorb, be a receptacle for the gaze in a dysfunctional system to contribute to feed a system mid crumble, a system exploiting, even parasiting off of this feed, this voluntary feeder. Butler, I had been told all my life that this was a good and necessary thing to like and Taryn did together, a kind of birth. I knew birth was painful and bloody no matter what, but this was something else, something worse. And I wasn't ready to see it. Maybe I never would be. Yeah, I couldn't not see it. Closing my eyes didn't help. Tikatoy had a grub, found a grub still eating its egg case. The remains of the case were still wired into a blood vessel by their own little tube or hook or whatever. That was the way the grubs were anchored and the, egg, and the way they fed. The, they took only blood until they were ready to emerge. Then they ate their stretched elastic egg cases. Then they ate their hosts. Tigatoy bit away the egg case, licked away the blood. Did she like the taste? Did child ha childhood habits die hard or not die at all? The whole procedure was wrong, alien. I wouldn't have thought anything about her could seem alien to me. Is this an order that is careening towards dishevelment, dismantling, a natural chaos? Where is the fulcrum, the balance, the tipping point between function and dysfunction? Is high functioning enough? Who does divergence, emergence, or typicality serve? Does this matter? Is the end only asymptotic, forever reaching but never arriving? Not a big bang, but a slow boil. Even the prepper's death, death grip loosens with revelation. Cassandra lets down her hair. The one remaining currency boils down to animal needs, animal halves, we continue envisioning a distance between us and this tether to physicality, self-soothing through the pixel, an infinite vector. Thank you. Next up, we have Janie Woodbridge, and I'm going to introduce Janie. So Janie will be presenting with us um, today a presentation entitled Given, Giving a Shape to the Invisible. Janie is an assistant professor of textile design at the college, the Wilson College of Textiles at North Carolina State University. And you can see more about Janie um, through the program and through the app. Um, please feel free to check up on the panelists here and in other presentations. They have the bio up, TSA has the bios and the abstracts up on the app and the program. Okay, Janie. Thank you, Gabe, and hello everyone. I'm very glad to be here today. Today I'm going to talk to you all about how I've used weaving as a means of conveying my own narrative. I'll be showing you some examples of projects that have helped me process some abstract concepts that were difficult to communicate verbally. Specifically, I'll be talking about how I've used this medium to convey invisible, emotional, and internal elements that I could not effectively communicate through words. First of all, I wanted to talk to you about what brought me to and kept me weaving. One of the things that I've always loved about weaving is that there's always a formula. There's a set number of ends, picks, weave drafts, and weft rotations that one needs to follow in order to achieve a desired pattern. It's like a puzzle. If an element or a piece of the formula is missing, it does not work. By nature, I've always been an anxious person with a worried brain. Growing up, I would have counting and checking rituals that I would follow in, a, in an attempt to control some of this worry. When, it, when I came to weaving and found that the act of counting and checking were part of the process, something clicked. I would found a means of putting some of my rituals to use in a positive way and to channel that anxious energy. Whenever I would finish a weaving piece, it would feel like I had channeled and unloaded some of that worried emotion into something that I could actually see. A common theme that has shown up in my work over the years is creating color ombres. I enjoy the process of blending one color to another through a process of organized alternating threads. These ombres are very specific with the density of one color blending with another in a preset mathematical formula. And in a way that I could always be checking on them and making sure that they were working. Here's some examples that I did in the early 2000s. And then again, some examples I did in 2013. These are just some rag rugs I did. 
I find this color ombre technique very compelling and engaging in the way to the way my brain works. On top of the counting and checking that is part of the weaving process, there's an added counting and checking process and making sure that the alternating colors are always properly rotating. In 2014, I found myself wanting to further investigate this theme of controlled ombre color, but this time wanting to push that interaction further. I wanted to apply this to a double wave structure with an alternating ombre warp system that would interact with each other in very controlled locations. So here's an example of the two ombre warp colors I put at the top. Um, so there's a system A that moves from purple to pink to yellow, and system B moves from yellow to pink to purple. And these were set up on a floor loom on a Maycomber with a double weave block pattern that moved from smaller to larger blocks. Every element in this was very planned and formulaic. And here's the final result of that project. There were four studies that demonstrated that idea of color interaction in controlled locations. And some details. After finishing those pieces, I wanted to take that concept of controlled ombre even further and apply it to a thread controlled loom. These warp systems were also set up in an ombre rotation, but for this, I had to dye them to specific colors on the existing white warp that was on this TC1. To do this, I pulled it forward, split it into two sections, and then set them up to dye. After dyeing, they were pulled back in order to weave, which it shows it on the right. And there's an example of those two alternating ombre warp color rotations. System A moves from white to turquoise and navy, and B goes from navy to turquoise to white. The jacquard element of this design was created in Adobe Photoshop. I created two different designs for this warp. One was a broken circle, the other was a broken circle with geometric uh, patterns shown right here. All the weave structures were double weaves so that I could alternate which system came to the surface at controlled times. Here's an example of the weaving process for that. The weft was run on two alternating predetermined ombres as well so I could maximize that control color. And here is one of the finished pieces from that project. And there's another one and some details. So the benefit of using the jacquard is that I could actually get some physical shape out of this, not just blocks. Once I finished those pieces, I decided to make it more complicated and take it a step further by adding a third ombre warp system to the mix. My plan for this was to weave it on a multi-harness CompuDobby loom. I started this process by winding and setting up three different warps and then putting them under the 12 harnesses. So you can kind of see, I've got three leaf sticks going on and they're all in like different setups. So here's the example of the three alternating warp color rotations. And these are a little bit more complex. One goes from yellow to green to blue, back to green to yellow. And then you can kind of see how they all kind of will work together. Um, this was also planned to be on a block weave structure that moved from smaller to larger blocks. So the weave draft for this was created through weave point seven. Each block had six harnesses associated for three separate layers, a plain weave. Each one is on a different warp system that weaves with a different weft system. And there's an example of it in weaving. You can see that the loom was under a lot of tension from all the threads that needed for the construction. And I broke a lot of threads. There's the finished product for that. And a detail of it. So you can see where things are coming up of layer one and layer two. So I have certain areas where they're gonna be 100% of one color and then they're gonna break apart. So I'm gonna change gears a little bit here and talk about a project that I started more recently. This piece is more about losing a sense of control than holding on to it. About two years ago, I had an incident where I hit my head pretty badly, and re which resulted in a concussion. I had a lot of trouble processing during this time and was often confused and lethargic. I felt like I lost a sense of time and sharpness and everything became foggy. As time passed, things slowly improved and I began to reflect on the experience and what it was like to be in that condition. I wanted to figure out a way to convey a sense of confusion and a loss of time. As a means of understanding my own brain, I found myself looking at images of how brain functions are conveyed. And I began thinking of how I could use that to communicate what I was going through. So I began by playing around with the concept of how brain function might be applied to a pattern design and how we might be able to use parts of the pattern to represent normal brain function. I created a setup where nine different colors were used to represent a brain function and all colors were organized to rotate around a central universal color. 
and I assigned a color to each brain function. So motor function was in the middle because that's kind of everything kind of contributes to that. Um, I then applied wave structures to this concept. And I created these wave structures in CAD and then the, the weave software EAT. And then they were woven on an industrial loom that we have on our campus. Different thread combinations represent the brain, different brain functions. So the one in the middle has all three, has three weft colors mixing where they start. And in the other squares, there's maybe only one or two of them coming together, but the middle part is where they're all coming together. Um, after setting up the initial design cube, I began repeating that cube and rotating it to, her, to that would represent a day and time passing. The initial pattern design was done in Adobe Photoshop. The repeating shape and rotation of the cube represents more time passing and, and then starts creating its own pattern. So there's you know one day, there might be eight days, and here it's expanding, expanding. And that's a larger example of that repeated cube design. So this is supposed to represent normal brain function. It kind of goes into a pattern. So now that I had created a sense of normal brain function in time passing, I needed to create a sense of abnormal brain function. So to do this, I started to distort the color rotation in each cube. Some cubes got shuffled around, some became imbalanced with more of one color than another. And this was all to represent when parts of the brain are not working and communicating properly with each other. This step was meant to make the cubes more difficult to look at and to process. So here's a larger image of that distortion in the digital design layout and in the woven fabric. And there's the final design layout before going into the weave software and weaving on the larger loom. So this visual design timeline shows an area of normal brain function prior to the concussion, the onset of the injury, and then towards the bottom is where it begins to start to come back together. Um, and there's the final product for this. Um, I felt like was, it was an effective means of visual communication for something that was really hard to verbally explain. Um, and in the future, I, I intend to keep working through this concept is that I don't think I'm done with it. There's a lot more I wanna explore with it, but um, yeah, it's still something I'm, I'm, I'm working through as this concussion's lasted a long time. So anyway, thank you for your time. And I'm going to now introduce Robin. Robin Holler is an associate professor and area coordinator of the textile design program at East Carolina University School of Art and Design. Her work has been exhibited nationally and internationally, and she has received multiple grants to pursue her research in digital design and weaving. Robin resides between her hometown of Cleveland, Ohio, and, a, and her place of employment in Greenville, North Carolina. Great. So, um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Robin. And um, first, I just want to say it's, it's really a pleasure to be in this panel with Gabe, Janie, and Kate. Um, it's really been awesome working with you to get this presentation together. Um, also, thank you to TSA for this opportunity. And then um, also thank you to everybody who's attending this session. So thank you. Okay. So I'm gonna start out by showing um, a few of my earlier pieces that were sort of the beginning of this narrative. And, and then I will transition into my more recent work. So my research focuses on current events that are impacting the diverse communities, cultures, and individuals within the United States and ultimately people worldwide. This piece was created in response to the escape and rescue of the three young women who were kidnapped and held for more than a decade in Cleveland, Ohio. It is a celebration of their survival and their resilience. As events unfold across our nation, whether tragic or triumphant, I find myself engaged in a variety of conversations sparked by personal opinions, beliefs, and affiliations. I created this piece after President Barack Obama announced the, le the legalization of same-sex marriage, which happened to happen on my birthday, <laughs> so it was pretty awesome. As a reaction to this dichotomy of exchange, I create work anchored in traditional textile techniques, combined with digital technology to express this debate using Photoshop as a design tool in, in conjunction with the TC1 and TC2 hand jacquard looms, 
offers me the freedom to translate my ideas into an art fabric. Whether the work refers to the opioid overdose crisis or mental health awareness, the creation of a piece thread by thread is a symbol of growth from knowledge. Some works are inspired by my own personal narrative while others are meant to employ conversations across the table. They become translations of the human experience, moments in time, moments in history, moments in my history. And more and more I find that sometimes the weight of everything can almost cripple you. And this particular piece was created um, after the 2016 election. So my most recent body of work was in response to the current concerns with immigration and the cruelty towards foreign refugees seeking asylum and a better life for their families. And it became a reflection on my own heritage, family and memory. So in 2017, I went to Italy with my mother and my mom who is a first generation Italian American but most of her family still lives in Northern Italy. So this is just a picture of us when we went to Italy together. <laughs> I've been to Italy several times, but this time I seem to be much more aware or and intrigued by the architecture, coupled with the stories of my mom's family and their experiences. As I snapped photos, I looked for interesting relationships between old and new, man-made and nature, and elements of light and dark. These were the photographs that were the inspiration for this body of work. I combined traditional Italian patterns and motifs with the photographs for additional layers and meaning and conceptual significance. The imagery ranged from relatively recognizable Italian landmarks, such as the Duomo in Florence, to abstracted imagery initiated from wrought iron fixtures to marbled walls and patterned floors. Each image was significant to me as it related to my family, heritage, time, and memory. But sometimes the work strayed from the original concept. So while in Italy, we did have an audience with Pope Francis. And then while I was creating this series of work, the Pennsylvania Archdiocese sexual abuse scandal blew wide open. And so this, this series was created with a floral pattern for each of the 1,000 plus victims that the Pope and the Catholic Church tried to silence. and the massacre at the Tree of Life Synagogue by a white supremacist, where 11 innocent lives were lost. So using photographic imagery allowed me to mark this time, this experience, and this memory. When I look at each weaving, it is like looking at that memory frozen in time. I remember everything about what prompted me to create the piece. I remember the day, the conversations, and the stories that were told. And it, it really started me thinking because, um, you know, we often have hundreds, if not thousands, of photos on our phones, on our computers, and somewhere in the cloud. Um, and yet none of them ever get printed or put in a photo album anymore, at least mine don't. And in fact, recently I found myself going through all of my phone photos, fretting over which memories I would delete. 
And I realized that this body of work became my way of preserving this part of my life so as not to forget what is important. To be grateful for my heritage, my family, and to remember that their journey has led me to where I am today. They are moments in time, moments in history, moments in my history, translations of human experience. Thank you. So now I'm gonna introduce Kate Narker. And Kate Narker works between animation and weaving to dismantle images, narrative and material structures. She received an MFA from the California College of Arts in 2012 and is an assistant professor of textile design at North Carolina State University. Her work has been included in exhibitions throughout the United States and internationally, including the Museum of Craft and Design in San Francisco, the Contemporary Austin, and the San Jose Institute of Contemporary Art. Narker lives in Durham, North Carolina, and is represented by Jack Fisher Gallery. Okay, um, thank you everybody for joining our presentation today. Um, it's such an honor to get a chance to talk about my work to fellow textile artists and scholars. So thank you for taking the time to come today. Um, so I thought I would start out with a general overview of my work and then look at specific ideas and lines of research that have informed my studio practice along the way. For the past several years, I've been working almost exclusively between video and textiles, and I'm interested in seeing how these two areas can inform one another and also provide a framework to investigate perception in the haptic. So I wanted to start with this um, animation that I created back in 2012 because it includes a lot of the underlying themes in my work that I continue to explore today. Um, the title of this animation is Line by Line and it's about two and a half minutes long. Okay, so there are um, two things that I want to pull from this animation and focus on today. Um, the first idea is the underlying basis of my work, and that is introducing movement to weavings. Um, what I have found is that when I animate woven fabric, it becomes this great tool to interrogate and disassemble imagery. Um, through the sequence of time, I can gradually strip away or introduce details of thread to see 
how little information is required until something is legible. So I'm interested in this form of mechanical abstraction and also in the perceptual act of deciphering something. Um, the second idea is the formal and theoretical relationship between woven cloth and video or film. And so I'll go through some of the theories that have informed my work and also look at the structural and material uh, properties that overlap in film and weaving. Before going deeper into any of this, I wanted to talk a little bit about my process. Um, the, this is the cloth that I wove to create that animation. And it's um, 40 feet long and I wove it on a TC1 jacquard loom. And I was drawn to jacquard weaving because of the lack of restrictions. Um, as many of you likely know, unlike a floor loom, each thread is controlled individually. So you're able to weave abstract patterns and representational images that are not confined to a repeat. So um, when I create an animation, I begin by digitizing film or video, and then I render out a series of still images that I then arrange into a sequential grid. And then I weave lengths of cloth and scan the fabric um, back into digital format and animate it using a variety of uh, tools like After Effects or um, Final Cut. So it really is this process of translation where I work repeatedly back and forth between hand and digital tools. So in the end, there are two components to each piece. Um, there is the weaving and then there is the film. And I've shown um, the work in different ways, sometimes together, sometimes apart. Um, I showed this animation broken up into a series of loops and they play uh, repeatedly without sound. So sometimes I'll rework projects into different formats depending on the exhibition space. In this case, you can see that the motion moves across some of the monitors. Um, so this was a way to sort of fragment the event in a spatial composition. I've also projected my video work. Um, this was a piece shown in an industrial gallery space. And then I showed the weaving um, in a separate room of, apart from the video. So one of the things that I love about weaving is that an image or pattern is created through a structural system rather than resting on the surface. And I often try to find ways to abstract an image by its own physical makeup so that the material itself becomes the armature of abstraction. In this animation and in several others, um, there's a tension between the image and its underlying support. So when the image falls apart and the thread becomes a pattern, the material overrides the picture that it is representing. Um, the title of this piece is 10. Um, this is the woven cloth for the animation, and you can see that it resembles a physical, tangible zoom or focus. And recently, I've been thinking about how cinematic techniques can be materialized and expressed through cloth. So si really simple cinematic devices like focus, framing, or fading from one scene to the next. I'm interested in working these things out physically through weaving. So for example, in this series of weavings, um, a pattern comes into focus, not through a digital device or the turning of a lens, but through the surface and structure of the cloth itself. And each weaving here is nine by 12 inches. Uh, this is a, an installation shot of the weavings we just saw there on the left and on the right hand side is another series of a floral image coming into focus. And the title of these two series um, is Focus and Fade Out. One of the main ideas driving my work is this notion of haptic visuality. And it was defined by Alois Riegel in the late 1800s. Uh, Riegel was an art historian from Austria and a curator of textiles. And he defined haptic visuality as a way of looking where the eye operates as an organ of touch. 
Regal differentiated haptic visuality from optical vision, explaining that in optical vision, like in a Renaissance painting on the left, everything is arranged for the viewer and you're pulled into a scene and the focus is on content, depth, and form. Whereas in haptic visuality, when you are looking at, say, a rug, the focus is on texture, temperatures, and surface. And this idea has been built on to go beyond perception and to describe ways of understanding things. For example, in film theory, um, there's haptic criticism, and it is a way of engaging with a film to find meaning through textures and activity on the material surface, rather than taking a distance to analyze the narrative. Research and conversations on the haptic as it relates to the sense of sight have been happening for a long time. One of my favorite examples comes from the Bauhaus. Uh, in the 1930s, there was a lot of discussion in the Bauhaus on the relationship between sight and touch. The photographer Laszlo mahali Naj was interested in exploring the relationship between optical and tactile properties. And this is a touch panel that the Bauhaus weaver Odie Berger uh, wove for the research. This is uh, data from some of the research where they were trying to track how sight and touch relate. So I've been exploring how sight and touch interact through weaving and animation. And I've been working with subject matter that underscores this notion of touch or this idea of understanding things through touch. These are stills from that animation. In this piece, I was interested in creating uh, an illusionary depth on a woven surface to explore these moments where sight and touch kind of compete or where there is a tension between the two. This is the weaving that I created um, for that animation. And the title of this piece is Horse Emotion, which is a nod to Edward Boybridge's early motion study, uh, Horse in Motion. These are images of Boybridge's cabinet cards created in 1878. And something I was thinking about when I was creating this animation was how these early cinematic studies were happening in the midst of life-changing technological innovations. The telegraph, railroad, and photography were collapsing the distance between time and space at a rate that had never been experienced before. Uh, Moybridge's horse in motion can be seen as an attempt to hold time still and catch up to a world that was rapidly changing human perception and consciousness. So in this animation, and these are details from the animation, um, I was thinking about how Digital technologies continue to accelerate the way we communicate and process information, especially now when everyday experiences are becoming increasingly digitized and almost completely disembodied. I wanted to use a moving image to explore this loss of touch. So rather than seeing a horse um, gallop in time as we do in Moybridge's piece, this animation shows someone reaching out and the focus is on physical touch. And this is uh, a weaving I created as part of the series and it is about 36 by 24 inches. Beyond my interest in exploring touch and haptic perception, there's a historical relationship between textiles and cinema that has been a focus of my research for many years. 
When I first started to translate moving images into weavings, I also began to approach textiles as a cinematic medium. Very early on, I was inspired by textiles from the 13th and 14th centuries and was interested in how tapestries were essentially the first forms of narrative cinema. This is the apocalypse tapestry from the 1300s. These were large scale sequential narratives that embodied the cinematic, not just in the way they told stories, but in these aesthetic and experiential qualities. I've always been interested in the seductive quality of cloth and its potential to envelop the viewer and be larger than itself. There is an article called Reflections on Fabric and Meaning by Arthur Danto, where he discusses Raphael's tapestries that hung in the Sistine Chapel. And he talks about how the cloth achieved these cinematic visual effects. With the light and the drafts of wind, there was an, a moment to moment interaction that gave a motility to woven images that would have been unavailable before the advent of the moving picture. So it is exciting for me to think about textiles as something that not only embodies the cinematic, but actually may have influenced the development of cinema itself. There is also a parallel structure between VHS technology and weaving that I explore in my work. VHS technology is made up of static vertical lines with information running through horizontally, just like in weaving. And I often select frames and found videos where this underlying analog structure surfaces and resembles weaving patterns and hijacks the narrative content. This piece is called West Main, and it's one of the first Jacquard animations that I created. Here I was seeking instances where the video noise interrupts the sequence so that there is this back and forth between the depth of the scene and the material surface. And this is the cloth for that piece and it's six feet long and 28 inches wide. This is another example of that same idea. In this piece, I manipulated the surface with machine stitching. And this is um, the fabric and it's also six feet long and 28 inches wide. I thought I would end with images of my most recent work. Uh, these are photos from an exhibition I was in this year at the Contemporary Art Museum in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, this is a cluster of weavings that I wove with a waxed linen weft. And I'm really excited about the potential of blowing up the scale of the weft and how that can abstract imagery and patterns. In each of these weavings, I was trying to create a gradient between the photographic details and the, the weave structures. This is an installation shot and um, next to the cluster of weavings, I projected an animation. and it just plays on a loop. Um, this is a large jacquard weaving that I just completed. Um, it will be installed at the Indianapolis airport and it is nine feet wide and 48 inches tall. This is a digital rendering, but the idea here was to create an illusionary depth on a traditional um, weaving pattern. And this is the actual weaving. I did not have time to have um, professional photographs taken. so. This is, um, this is a picture of me and my six-year-old daughter trying to hold it up. And that is all. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, so we can have the panelists hop back in with their video and we will be taking some questions. So if you have uh, to the attendee and attendees, the audience, 
Um, please put your questions in the question and answer, um, whatever you have, and try to be um, mention who you are addressing it to, which panelists, so uh, Janie, Robin, Kate, or I. So we have one question here um, from Nancy Powell, Hi. and um, I, I, I'm not sure, who, I, it seemed like it came up during Kate's presentation at the beginning, but um, it might pertain to everybody, I don't know. Are the TC2 jacquard pieces on a white warp and, and an and, sorry. Uh, can you all see this chat too, by the way, the open question? I tried to make it live. Is it open now? Hopefully you can see it word for word. Are the TC2 jacquard pieces on a white warp end and end, end of two colors or multiple colors in a planted or rainbow warp? I, I would assume that most of the color comes from the weft face weaves, beautiful. I think that and, might be for Janie. Yeah, and, and Nancy, nice to, nice to hear from you. I'm glad you're here. Um, so the TC2, we haven't set up there, but the, the ones that were done on the jacquard, the College of Textiles is, is now on a black and white, um, but it's on the, the four color weft rotation. So it's the black and white are just giving us shade and then we're getting tone and color from the weft. So, yeah. So did anybody else want to throw any knowledge out there about your warp weft situation on your TC2s? Um, I, I can kind of talk about mine too. Um, I did see that, that Q&A come in. Um, so I don't know if that, that was right after mine was finished too. So I don't know, maybe it was towards me. I don't know. <laughs> but um, the, um, my piece is particularly, I mean, I tend to work with, um, I hand dye all my warps and weft. And I, I, I don't, um, so I have painted warps or ECOT um, patterns in my warps and wefts painted wefts. So the color interaction is really is warp and weft. I don't really work with um, weft face structures in particular. So it, it is a combination of the warp and weft. Kate, did you want to jump in or? Um, you don't related to. to which question? I, I, guess, I just. <laughs> yeah, just I guess we're just laying out the land of uh, warp and weft for what your setup is. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I we just got a TC2 at NC State. So we haven't gotten our grubby paws on it yet, but um, I think we're gonna have a white warp. The, a lot of the animations I showed were on, on a black warp, so. Cool. Okay, so we have some other questions. Um, this one is to everyone, so good luck to all of us. Um, hopefully you can see it in the, in the question answer box. Um, to anyone, uh, and it says in parentheses, inspired by the idea of waxed linen, how does materiality become a part of the translation process between either computer draft and the physical weaving? What experimenting happens there? Hmm. Well, I know I can try to answer that. For my practice, I often have to find a balance with the scale of the of the weft and legibility. I always, I you know, if I blow things up too much, um, because I'm often making animations, and each frame is no more than five inches wide. I'm pretty limited with the amount of um, picks that can create an image. So um, I don't know if it's um, necessarily about the scale, but um, I have found some interesting, I've had some luck with experimenting with different types of fibers like elastic fibers that sort of bubble up on the surface or um, wefts that I can comb out to kind of create a little bit of motion um, as they shift from frame to frame. I can talk a little bit about um, or address that too with my pieces. Um, the the work that I showed in this presentation didn't really use much of um, like non-traditional or um, materials. I, I tend to work very specifically with uh, cotton and rayon um, or tensile, something that has a maybe dull versus shiny because I'm working a lot with dualities, whether in meaning or um, concept and, and also dichotomies of these conversations that I'm having with people and, and what's happening in, in the world now and how we're so 
um, polarized. And so that, that duality, I, I use my materials in that way to sort of speak to that concept. Um, and in the, the photographic work, my newest stuff, <laughs> I, uh, I used some sparkly material, which was really unusual for me. I mean, it was, it was, um, like literally, um, gold and silver and like a copper color. And I really loved it, but it's kind of like that love hate. Like, you know, we always, you know, with students, students are always drawn to something sparkly and you're always like, well, you know, you know, you, you, you try and like get them to, why are you using it? Why do you want to use it? And, and I just kind of let myself be free with this last set of, um, weavings. Cause I, I just, I just really wanted a little sparkle in them. <laughs> Janie, did you want to jump in? Um, I think the only thing I wanted to say too is it is interesting when you're working digitally and you're working at pixel level, like so small, and we're often working so flat that it's, you know, it's hard to know how it's going to translate too. And I, it is something we always have to think about. Um, and I guess it depends a little bit on how you intend it to be seen. Like I, I was thinking for Kate, like it's probably a big deal, like that you actually have texture on the surface and the, the threads sit on top and kind of how those interact and. I think it really, it really depends on what you're trying to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, I will, I will say like the one thing that I, so obviously I'm working with a lot of floats and just like letting things kind of fall apart and weaving nothing a lot. But um, the one piece that popped into my head was uh, that I've done is cotton weed, which is um, it's a hundred percent cotton, but I've shoved a cotton plant that I grew into the actual weaving so and it actually it kind of gauges up into it so it starts with a really fine I think like 2022 sorry 22 uh kind of um weight of industrial cotton to like a hand spun white natural white cotton up to a brown chunky hand spun hand grown homegrown cotton that I've grown um and then has the plant itself with the roots um kind of just shoved in there so technically it's all 100% cotton, but there, it's, anyway, so I think that that kind of pertains a little bit to um, that one question with materiality for me. Um, we have a couple more questions. So this one's to Kate Narker. Let me try to get it live for everybody to see. Um, where can we see your, where can we find your animations? Y'all did awesome. Oh, um, thank you. They're, uh, they're on my website or Instagram. Uh, my website is my name, um, and yeah, I'll also be having a large video in the Indianapolis airport <laughs> soon, if you all happen to be traveling, which I'm sure many of you will not be, but. Yeah, um, yeah, If I, feel free at any time, panelists, to throw like more info uh, in the chat with links if you want to your site or something. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get around to airports at some point soon safely. Um, all right, next question. What is the difference? We're all going to love this one. What is the difference between <laughs> TC1 and TC2? Old version, new version, I guess. Like, yeah, it's the updated. Everything's contained now in a, in a, in a castle. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think it's more efficient. Yeah. Yeah, GC2 yeah. is just the late the upgraded version. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I saw that question was from Polly Barton, who I just have to um, say, hi, I love your work. <laughs> and I'm really excited that you're at our session. <laughs> I'm very inspired by your weavings. <laughs> yeah, we have some really great people here. It's, it's pretty flattering. Um, yeah, we're in good company. We're definitely not alone. It's great. Um, so the next one says for Gabe Duggan, and this is from John, John Paul. So hi, John Paul. Um, Hopefully I didn't just erase it. There it is. Um, I'm interested in your collaborative long-term relationship with the particular TC1 loom. Does this loom have agency or animacy? How do you engage with that in the making and in the form? Um, so a lot of people, I, this kind of is nice that it cascades off the TC1, TC2 question. Um, people that have been around TC1s and then have experienced the TC2 as well, you know that the TC1 it's definitely a little bit slower, you know, or maybe twice or three times as slow with its lifts. And um, so that gives you a lot of time to just be there with it. Um, and of course, weaving, no matter what kind of hand weaving you're doing, it takes time and you're talking to the loom, you're with the loom, you're very present and physical. 
Um, so for me, I think just the physicality of it, and I've always, you know, stood when I've woven on this TC1. Um, so for me, it just is very, um, it feels like very one-on-one -on -one intimate and, um, you know, there's definitely like struggles. And for me, I always get to a point in the process, whatever pro pro uh, project I'm working on, whatever the format, I'm, I feel like I always get to some kind of breaking point where I'm taking a lot of my frustrations with myself out on myself, but talking to the work. Um, and then there's like kind of like a breaking point where that just can't hold anymore. And then that's where like the next revelation, I don't know, it feels like then you fall off the cliff or you, you break through to the other side. And that's where like you realize, oh, it's perfect. This is where I'm supposed to be. This is the thing I'm supposed to be doing. Or you, you're like, oh, what if I did that? And then you have like the next revelation for the next thing. But um, this machine, because it's like been dysfunctional and you know, malfunctioning and stuff. Um, I mean, it's like, you know, when the car is like a little bit struggling to get up the mountain or something, you, it's like, it doesn't hurt to talk to it. You're like, well, I'll try to cheer it on. And um, yeah. All right. So we have another question um, from V to Plume. And it is, uh, I don't know, hello from everybody. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in the highlighting of your highlights of errors, mishaps, accidents in the traditionally very controlled world of weaving. These are all wonderfully personal approaches. I'm having trouble finding a question, but perhaps I wonder if you have considered this approach as a reflection of the difficult states of the world right now. Anyone? You know, this very strange situation in the world right now is kind of making me learn to let things roll more too. And so kind of maybe giving into more of, sometimes I feel like I'm always fighting the limb, like I'm making it do what I want it to do. And someone's kind of forcing it to do it. And sometimes I think it's an interesting time to kind of let fight, to let, to, to kind of let it influence what, what it's going to be next. Like, I think, yeah, there, there's so, I feel like my first response to things being so out of control is to try to control it. But I think as we've been through this through months and months and months and years, like it's kind of, you loosen up. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to, if that'll affect the work, but my first thought on that. I would just add, I think I trying to be improvisational in the weaving process has been an ongoing um, goal of mine. <laughs> and I think that is um, really the advantage of the TC1 and TC2 is that it's, you know, you're able to make these changes right there at the loom, either with your digital, with on the digital side or the material side. Yeah. So I have found that, you know, just being in that setup, standing in front of the loom with the computer right next to me, I can make decisions on the fly that, um, and just, you know, experiment more rapidly, <laughs> which sometimes yields to some interesting failures. Um, more so than I would say, well, I think my traditional floor loom, um, no, I think that, yeah, it's the same challenge in terms of being improvisational. I don't really, um, as far as like my work in working on the newer loom at ECU, the TC2, um, I, I'm not really, I don't really have a response to, um, the loom malfunctioning, um, you know, warps not raising or, or raising all the time and, you know, having floats. And I'm actually just enjoying that right now, not having to <laughs> um, fuss with, with the loom and it actually doing what I want it to do. But what I, in, in my work, um, because I work with um, hand dyed and, and patterned warp and weft, my sort of response to that is, um, yeah, that, that, you know, you can plan and plan and plan as much as you want but there are going to be things that, that don't go your way. And so as you're winding back or at, you know, and there's a shift in the color or there's, um, you know, things don't quite line up when you're trying to line up warp and weft um, patterning. To me, that's part of uh, sort of that, um, uh, that, that combination of, you know, um, when we think about weaving that, you know, the warp is, is sort of set and we can't change it, but 
um, our, the weft is something we can change and it's our choices that we make. And so there's, there's this, again, you know, that, that hard line of, of planning from, to every single little pixel in your design, but there's things you can't control just like in life. And really things like right now spinning out of control in our society and our world, you know, there's, there's only so much we can control, but we can if we go vote, right? So. Hopefully. Yeah. Sorry. That plug in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, and I, I definitely have to respond to this one. I think, and yeah, it's, there's inherently with the, that specific machine I've been working with forever. It's like, it just has become part of the story. Um, and it, it's cool. Cause it's, it's taught me, I don't remember who just said it, but it's taught me like this letting go. Right. It's like, it's made me question, okay. Yeah. Really. Does it, yes, like, yes, make good cloth and yes, understand, you know, master your technique or, help, you know, hold your capital C craft well, but um, it's like also, but why? <laughs> and uh, especially now. And yeah, I, I did find that like, when I went to start putting this presentation together, you know, we submit these abstracts and, you know, these are thoughts that have been on our minds for years, usually. And then we submit the abstracts, you know, months in advance. And then by the time we get to it, it's you know kind of in a different place. And so we're here now. And so when I started working on this, I was just like, it just, I couldn't, everything, at least through this presentation, I realized that everything was just about what's happening. It just, it's, or it's like a metaphor, right? But it's also, um, it, it just felt very natural and impossible to avoid that, um, Right now, at least things feel like they're falling apart and they are, um, but like, what is the end, right? How many ends can we have? How many apocalypses can we have? Um, things change, you know? And so it, yeah, it probably is gonna get a lot worse. It might, I don't know, but um, it's not, it can't sustain that. Nothing can sustain that. So seeing that like, and I think that the materials and a dysfunctioning loom, uh, <laughs> noise and fracturing of pixels and actual glitching um, all of those just are perfect examples of like almost like a yoga practice or something where you just have to be in it and trust that like there's something going on here that we can learn from um, but it, sometimes it's beyond words or you know names and actions you know um, which is thankfully what art is for and why I think the materials are speaking for me at least right now. Um, nothing makes sense. Uh, but then I look at what's been going on in my work and I look at, I feel what's happening. And it's like, oh, okay. There's lots of sense here. Um, next question. So at Kate, uh, do you, what do you feel is gained and lost in the translation of digital? Let me make sure it pops up. Of digital to physical, back to digital. Mm. Yeah, well, I think um, for anyone who has woven on a TC1 or TC2, it's so satisfying to the translation from digital to physical because it feels like you're pulling pixels off a screen and it's a material that you can pick apart and interrogate, you know, in your hands and sort of understand on a very structural level. Um, but then I do think, you know, for me, at least going back from material back to digital, um, it's sort of ironic, I think, because it, even though it's back on a screen, um, the materiality is really emphasized more and I'm able to um, draw attention, attention more so to the surface and the texture. I mean, I, I didn't get into it in my presentation really, but you know, in the Bauhaus, when they, when there were these discussions about sight and touch, they taught, there's an article by Ty Smith, um, where she talks about how weavings used to be a very optical object. They were in a large architectural space and people kind of thought of them as these optical functional objects. But then there was a shift and there were these close-up photographs of the weavings uh, in the Bauhaus magazine and in different publications. And it was that close-up photograph of the weaving that really kind of asserted weaving's tactility and I think um, I relate to that. You know, I think even though I'm putting my weavings back on a screen, it's sort of asserting this extra tactility. Great. All right, next we have uh, to all the presenters, 
do you have, let's see, make sure I get it in here. Um, do you consider when designing and weaving your works, the viewer's distance, like the distance from the work? Mm. You go, Kate. I, I, just, I just talked, but I'll just say the last weaving I showed um, with the optical folds, it looks horrible close. I mean, it looks like it's stained if you're standing too close to it. So I, that was a very um, relevant question. <laughs> I'm really hoping it's installed in an area that viewers can stand far, far away so that it's more legible. I was going to say, you know, there's something that within weaving, when you're far away from it, you need you're you you see something and you when you come up close you see something different so there's something about like bringing in the viewer wanting to see that but it's funny you all bring this up because my, my next step that i want to go to with um the brain cognition based weaving is actually the idea of how our brain puts images together like one of the main things i had to deal with is like my eyes didn't work together after this this they weren't like in sync. And I wanted to kind of put the idea of like how you put those together. So by far away, you would be able to see an image if you were to like look at it, but close up, it kind of comes apart. So I'm thinking about that a lot right now. <laughs> and especially as we're on the computer all the time and like just how we process close up things and things that are far away. It's I think becoming even bigger, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know um, about the rest of the panel, but um, I mean, most, my work is kind of getting a little bit smaller now, but it used to be quite large and I would, it would take me a while. I would weave it, take it off the loom, roll it up. And I couldn't look at it. Like I needed to just let it process and let it be done and let it sit on a shelf somewhere and then open it back up and get that distance from it. Because you don't, you know, when you're weaving it, you're so, you're six inches from it, you know, and, and, um, and then, and to me, that's sort of the telltale if the, if the piece was successful or not, you know, so, so, and, and I don't know if you mean if the, um, the question when they talk about distance, if you mean actual physical distance or distance from the, the concept, um, you know, like being able to appreciate the piece just for its formal qualities. Um, and is it important to really understand the concept? Um, you know, I think, um, I mean, all of our work is, is, is quite, I, I feel personally, um, is very stimulating visually. And so I think that whether or not the viewer really knows the concept, um, I think it can, it works either way. Um, and maybe it just is stronger when they read the artist statement or understand the concept. So. Um, I know that I don't really think about it too much when I'm doing my work, but I want to be more in control of it, um, like steering that a little bit more in my process. I do talk about it with my students all the time about how textiles have that power of being a, a giant banner that you can see from a distance um, or that covers a hill or a tree. You know, it can be anything, um, but it also, it always is intimate also. It always is a thread. It always refers to the hand. Um, all right, so next question we have for Kate, and I had this question too for you, Kate, so I'm so glad somebody asked it. Uh, it is from Allison. Can you talk more about the sound elements in your work? How do you select the samples and how does it inform other aspects of your process? Um, I think it varies piece by piece, but a lot of times sound is sort of the anchor that, um, allows one to decipher what the image is. For example, I have an animation of, um, of ocean waves and it, at many, throughout most of the animation, it's sort of hard to see what it is, but the sound is there to anchor the piece and sort of give an indication that it's the ocean. Um, but I also, I don't, I've been playing around with GarageBand and other um, audio tools to sort of abstract the sound as well. So um, I don't know, it, I think it, it depends on the piece, but lately too, I, I really just kind of want um, like a soft textural sound, like the sound of a record playing with no music or, you know, I, I find myself seeking out um, non-narrative sounds um, and then sort of mixed in with a little, just enough narrative 
sounds, <laughs> if that makes sense. I think it's pr a pretty, um, it sort of mirrors my, uh, my weaving process too, where I, I'm just always trying to find this balance of something that is just slightly legible. Hmm. But, yeah, I, I really, I want to talk more with you sometime about the no, the sound, the noise, the sound thing. I love that you said it's non-narrative and it, it has such a huge impact. Um, I like the choices you've been making already. Like, it doesn't matter if I like it or not, but um, <laughs> I connect with it. I feel it. Um, this is, I'm going to just switch into another question for Kate, and then we have a couple other things. Um, so you might have kind of half answered this already, but from Bobby, um, can you explain your process of turning your still or moving images into woven images frames? What is your process of determining what images are needed to communicate the greater picture? Impressive work. Um, so the process of turning the frames into a woven animation, um, it's pretty simple. I just, I always start with a video and then I render out a series. You can, when you have a video, you can, instead of exporting it to another video format, you can export it into a uh, series of sequential still images. And then I use those images to create a grid. And then that file is the one I apply weave structures to, to weave. And then, so I really, I have a side-by-side, -side, um, almost duplicate digital image and woven image. So I could potentially play two videos side-by-side -side and they, it would be the actual video and the woven animation and they go side-by-side. -side. I, I worked with um, an animation ad, or a media advisor in grad school. And I think that like in that world, it's called rotoscoping essentially mm -hmm. when you like draw over each frame but in this case, I'm weaving each frame. So it, it really is almost like a form of rotoscoping. Mm -hmm. um, but then in terms of, uh, I think there was a second part to the question, how do you decide which images? Is that right? Um, what is your process for de of determining what Im images are needed to communicate the greater picture? Oh, that's always a trial and error. I have so many unused weavings and I think um, it's a challenge because I more and more, I want, I oftentimes don't care about the subject matter, but I still want to animate something representational. <laughs> so I think that's always a challenge to find um, sequences and narrative imagery without, without being narrative. I, I'm gonna jump in here and say this too, Kate, to like add to it. I don't know if you've thought about like, projecting onto it like projecting the original like you said the original images mm -hmm. photographic images onto the weaving itself as it's like I guess as you're documenting it or photographing it or and then also since you're working black and white it's like you could flip it you know do mm -hmm. the negation and maybe yeah. almost get like a polarization or something I don't know it's or just render it completely mute or almost mute you know yeah 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 <sighs> But anyway, I'm excited for you about the airport too. I wish we could see it. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to throw a couple, like we got a couple little bits of like love in here that I'm just going to pop through and then we'll get to the next question. So Polly Barton said, I loved yours. I think that that was to you, Robin. Um, let's see. This is, this is interesting. Lori Carson, Carlson Steger said, um, a kind of common denominator of the TC12 weavers is that we are like high gamers in pursuit of that abstract expression. All of your presentations were intense. Thank you so much for sharing your works. Materials do play an important role in the expressions. Um, it is grand, Michael rolled, uh, it is grand to see the technology being pushed to exciting ends, as well as the relations and differences among the panelists. Thank you. And I think we have our next question now. Oh, and Julie, was following up and saying the question about physical distance was about physical distance, but the answers that addressed other di distances were interesting too. Oh, okay. Um, so our next question is, um, I am most impressed by all of your works and am interested in the physicality of your interaction with the process. How do you plan things in Photoshop beforehand and how much do you then integrate previous mistakes, quote unquote mistakes, and what software do you use? That's from Ruth uh, Schuing. Um, I do use Photoshop. Um, I used to use Jackhead, but that's it's no dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Neither here nor there. Um, but um, so I do use Photoshop, and 
I plan everything in Photoshop. I mean, yeah, to the pixel. I'm, but that's just me. I'm, I, I'm not good with improv improvisation. <laughs> so, um, but I do learn from, you know, previous projects, you know, previous pieces. So I learn what works or what doesn't or what I can fix or tweak and what will work better. But I do really plan really to the T. And I usually have like 15 or 20 different designs before I pick which one. I mean, you know, playing around with all the different weave structures and values and colors and everything. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty straightforward with my design. <laughs> Yeah, I would say I am too. And Robin, I learned in Jack had early on too, but we know we could do the weaves in Photoshop, but we also have the CAD software EAT, which is specifically for like industrial looms, but it's really, they have this great function in it where you can actually see like the 3D weave structure, which is really, really helpful because Photoshop is pretty flat. So I really like it helps me process what is going on to be able to like look at that and kind of flip it around, understand that interaction. And we, it also allows you to simulate things, which is really helpful. So if like, I don't want to commit to doing it until I kind of understand that I, what I've done is right. Cause I learn a lot by starting it too. Like sometimes I'm learning, I'm totally wrong. I'm going the wrong direction. I need to like pick it apart or whatever, but I, some of the computer software has really aided that process. Um, but you do have to see the materials woven to like you, you, you need to, some of it can be done on the computer too, but then once it actually comes together, you have there are decisions that have to be made still. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I think I use Photoshop in sort of a clunky way. You know, I often so I'll often bounce back and forth between After Effects and Photoshop. So if I want to create a sequence, an animated sequence where one weave structure fades into the next. I'll start with like red, a scene of sequence and after effects of red fading into blue. And then I import those sequential images into Photoshop and then apply the weave structures in a way so that it, it's almost like double weaving where one layer comes to the surface at, beyond the other one. Um, yeah, so, but, but I, I have to use Photoshop for that. <laughs> and then with the TC2, I, I, use the photo, I use Photoshop to apply the weave structures to the indexed images. Um, I didn't think I had much to say on this one. And, and I get what Robin was saying, that she's in control, right? I, when, I, when I taught weaving in Texas, I used to like have a disclaimer to my students that I'm, I'm not a capital W weaver. And Robin is what I would say is a capital W weaver. Like, why would you not control the pixels? Like, of course, like, a lot of us that are in the audience, we all know, I think you all know what I mean. Um, so I was just saying that, you know, I'm not really trying to do a great job sometimes, um, not all the time. So I realized though now it's like, yes, there's my aesthetic of like, I've always liked grit and noise. And, um, and I didn't think about it too much until right now that I have some, I have roots in photography, in darkroom photography. And so what, and the things that I always gravitated towards in darkroom photography was the materiality, like materializing light, materializing shadow. And I liked the grain of the film. Um, I liked when things got kind of eaten up by their own depiction, like where it, things were not necessarily out of focus, but so close in focus that they're obscure, right? And so I like things that kind of res out and all that like noise that is actually the opposite of what you'd ever want in a woven cloth. And that's actually my aesthetic is I, I, it's, I don't even see it back then. I didn't see it as like a falling apart the way I do now. Cause I know that it, that's what it does when you weave it. Um, but I just liked, it was almost like making the pixel, like trying to get the pixel or the grain of the negative to be physical and material. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing, I'm taking that into a, an already materializing process by weaving the, those that noise or that information mm -hmm. um I don't know that's that's interesting I hadn't thought about it. and and I just work in photoshop and I don't my process doesn't go too deep in the digital um I kind of think I I, I usually like will find ways to kind of break it down like I don't want it to look really good 
um, in the digital process. And then on the other end, I'm, I'm letting it, I'm guiding the machine through falling apart. Like that's what I like personally about the TC1, TC2 is you can kind of hand build it through some stuff that industrial machines wouldn't do. Um, okay, so Vita has said um, to us, you have all done a wonderful job today as well as in your artistic trajectories, inspirational, reflective, and wonderfully exciting work. This is very flattering from Vita, thank you. And nice to see so much exciting work occurring in NC, North Carolina. Thank you so much for your presentations today. Um, that's the last that we have so far of for Q and A from the audience. Um, I think, yeah, I meant to introduce us at the beginning too to say that we all met through um, the southeastern. I think mostly uh, a lot of us have met through the Southeast Fibers Educator Association, which is a little group that usually meets in fall at Penland uh, School of Crafts, and um, a lot of us have met through or had some kind of contact with Vita. Uh, who also had some contact with North Carolina and a certain TC1. Um, <laughs> a so, few of us. Yeah. You what? A few of us have used that limb. It's, <laughs> that, that's it, it, it has its, we were talking about this the other day. It has this whole narrative of people who've been on it too. And like, yes, it's falling apart. And, yeah. It's such a weird little, it's kind of a workhorse, but it's kind of a mule or something. It's yeah. Uh, yeah it's, a lot of love in that. Or thing. a zebra. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so I think that's kind of an interesting note to end on. I don't know if anybody wants to, if any of us want to say anything else we have. Okay, here we go. I nice see what happened to Loom <laughs> that it's still alive and trying. Yes, Vita, it's trying. Thank you. Vita. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I wonder if there's anything that we want to close with about like, we're all in the similar region. We're all like based around Raleigh, Durham and Eastern Carolina, um, North Carolina. And, um, yeah, we're all within a small radius of each other. And of course the state has a lot of history with textiles and yes. a lot of, um, and some of that still continues as a direct line into the College of Textiles that Kate and Janie are both at. Um, I guess, and we have, we have one more question. Did any, did any of you want to say anything about just, I'm just thinking about like the history and like our point yeah. in space and time now. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I was going to say just even like history of, of the textile industry. So I, I came from industry too. I worked a long time in the industry and, you know, I was very aware of like when it wasn't doing well either when, you know, if the company I was working for closed down or whatever. And we've always had to be very scrappy and kind of figure out and, and, and um, adaptive in this industry too. And I think especially now um, as things are changing rapidly and, you know, it either whether, whether it's the textile industry or the fibers industry or the craft world, but, you know, or I think we'll all be very ahead of the game too. And, um, you know, I always find it really inspirational to, to hear from other people and see what they're doing and to learn from each other to try to keep this little train moving. Um, but I think this is, you know, hopefully this is a, will be something we can keep, keep alive in some capacity um, in the state and in this, this country and the world, so. Um, somebody just said, uh, Francis Dorsey said, thank you. I especially liked the breakdown of the TC1 ins inspiring work. So that made me think of what you were just saying, Janie. It's, um, you were talking about the textile industry, right? And I'm from Buffalo, New York. Uh, Robin's from Cleveland. Kate, did you say you're from Cleveland? I missed all this earlier. Uh, yeah, I went to high school in Cleveland. So we know about like breakdown of industry. Like we're from steel towns and all that. So um, or, or industry loss and job loss and economies. Um, so, you know, being here in the context of textile industry history of North Carolina, and then um, that TC1, I was going to say the falling apart for me is, it has also paralleled um, some folding of fiber programs in higher uh, educational institutions, which mm -hmm. feel very, it felt like very ironic timing for some of these programs to have been closed in the last couple of years as Ani Albers was on the cover of Art Forum and yeah, things right. like that. The so tape. Yeah. I think that like, and that's something to think about when we're talking about like the apocalypse we're in right now this year in general, it's like a lot of this has happened before and like, it's still not finished, I guess. I don't know. There's, there's some really clear parallels with like industry and access to education and, um, access to tools and technology and knowledge. Um, 
I don't know. Do any of you want to say anything about that? Well, when the apocalypse actually hits, the weavers are going to be needed because everyone's going to need clothes. to make all of the clothes <laughs> and the structures. Yeah. And rewrite the computers. Yeah. Oh, you miss those computers, huh? <laughs> you pull out the abacus. <laughs> <laughs> Let me teach you. This is so. This is actually a good little segue to this too. Um, Elaine Hutchinson asked, as a weaver who, that has not used a digital loom yet, can you give recommendations for learning on those looms? You mentioned Penland. Are there others? So I think there's some specific answers that you can all offer, maybe. Yeah, I was going to say too. Like, you know, I was able to learn more about the TC one. Um, I was able to do a workshop with, with Bhakti Zeke and it came out through, I think, Digital Weaving Norway, the people who make TC1, TC2s. So you can even like go onto their website and sometimes they will offer classes. So that's one, one option. Mm -hmm. um, I know a Penlin, they have brought a TC1 there once and they built it there and took it apart and took it back away. And it used to be, the, the Jacquard Center had a TC2, I think. So, you know, I think they're, they're around. Once you kind of start digging around, you'll kind of get. Yeah, the Jacquard Center, um, in Henderson, North Carolina, um, they do, they got a TC2 and they do workshops. Um, right now, I think they're set up for the summer. I think they were canceled this this summer, of course. Um, and last summer, I believe, was sort of the inaugural um, plan for that. And so they had classes. So I think they're scheduling them for next summer. Yeah. And um, I, I believe they're taught by Catherine Amade. And um, so that's, that's one option. Uh, but there are facilities that are also kind of popping up all over the United States right now. Oh, yeah. um, and I'm just going to give a shout out to Cleveland. Um, the Praxis Fiber Workshop um, is, is trying to raise money um, to start a digital weaving lab, and they are going to have a TC2. And they're going to offer residencies and classes, and, um, and that's coming up. So that's, so look for that. So that's, again, Praxis. P R A X I S. <laughs> Isn't there? I forget the name of the place in Montreal. Do you guys know? It's not okay. Google. Not, May, really not Maywa. No. Yeah. Uh, I'll find it. Yeah. You. Yeah. yeah. Things are out there. You just have to start digging. But I, yeah, start start looking specifically like at the TC two TC one mm -hmm. website, and they they will they should yeah. link you to people. Right. That's a great resource. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. We got a couple people filling up the, um, so if you, if audience wants to pull up the question and answer, if you haven't yet, we have a link to Praxis, which is the Cleveland location of a Jacquard weaving center. And then also, um, uh, oh, good. Thanks. Megan. Montreal mm, center. Yeah, thank for you guys. yeah. we got a couple people jumping on that. What a great educated audience. I know. It's just it's just yeah. And the Harborfront Center in Toronto. I didn't know about that one. Thank you, Annie or Annie. Um, okay, we have a couple more questions. So John Paul has written, are we making a new weaving lineage in the aftermath of closures? I hope so. I hope so. That's what we all hope, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we see, we see it coming back and we see programs um, Although there are, I know, it, it, it's sort of like an oxymoron. There's weaving programs that are fading or closing, but yet there's this want for weaving. And so, you know, and, and more programs are, are getting more looms and getting the digital looms. And, you know, and so there, there's a need and a want for that weaving. And, and um, so hopefully, you know, I think it starts, it's, it does start in the, in the universities. I think, you know, we're teaching our students and then they're going out and they want it learn more and they're teaching more and and so it's spreading so hopefully yeah I think too we also have to kind of know that we cannot reinvent the wheel with it too we have to be super you know on top of innovation and things like that um it, yeah we, we can't just weave the exact same things over and over again and hope it will do okay or create the same programs we have to kind of be on top of of that and I think there needs to be, um, you know, more collaborations. Janie and I are in this world that, you know, we're in a, teaching in a program that's housed within a textile science and engineering yeah. school. So colleagues are create weaving fabric to be used to collect water for yeah. 
drought purposes and works, fields. But. Like they're creating <laughs> very or drafting fabric to be inserted for into someone's knee for surgery. Yeah. And I I think that it's there's so much happening on the technical scientific side of textiles and I I don't see a lot of I mean, there there could be much more collaboration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I'm gonna say they really they need us because they they're yes, just they like, keep it and they you know not really saying no we could actually do this structure or whatever. So I think it's just like opening that conversation between science and art and yeah yeah and pulling science into the art side too. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely thinking about that a lot too. Um, yeah, I, man, that's a tough question too. It's like I mean the answer is yes, it's an easy question, but then. Um, deep yeah yeah how is it phrased or making new leaving lineage yeah the question is what does that look like I know for me I was thinking a lot about accessibility and I was really frustrated with um obviously like yeah I feel attacked like don't close our programs like you know yeah. don't close a really one of the I won't, I won't get into it but you you all know and if you don't know you'll you just ask you could figure it out um and I'm not protecting anybody here it was University of North Texas. Um, but by closing that program, there was a really big radius of a, a gap geographically that got left be- because of that. And it was a strong, healthy program. So knowing that there's just, again, like anything, there's corruption, there's politics behind the curtain that we don't know. It, it's not logical. The math doesn't add up. The math actually adds up very clearly in the other direction. And yet here we are, and this is what happened. So for me, what I was most offended by was thinking about how this is a state school and also that it's in the geographic situation that like it, it you had to go, if you don't know about Texas, it's, it's huge and it's, 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 it's its own country, you know, that's great. Um, but you had to still outside of Texas, you would have to go for another three or four states until you got to a weaving program or a program that had a loom. And we were next door to a, another program that had closed in the 70s that had a fibers program. And as our program was shutting down, they were getting a TC2, had no longer any looms or fiber faculty or any fiber knowledge or support. So there's irony of people rushing to get these TC2s um, without any knowledge. And they're trying to throw them up in fab labs or whatever and just click print, um, but they don't have the physical the knowledge that I think Janie and Kate were talking about that it, we really do bring a lot to the table with this embodied knowledge um, by being in the, being up in the grease, you know, getting in the engine of the car, um, actually hand weaving. So as far as like the lineage, the new weaving for me, I, I want, I want these things to be accessible at state schools or whatever format of education is going to be accessible and to have it be, be pulled out of, and, and so that it's so that weaving programs are going to be only standing in like private institutions, um, which are great, but we need variety, right? We can't just have it all in one or the other. Um, so that's that's what I was thinking about a lot. That I serve a lot of students that um, definitely have money on their mind and don't have it. So anyway, uh, next question we have. Um, from Catherine Dormer, given weaving is one of the first industrial technologies and spawns so much, or actually she's just saying, I think this actually is a good segue into what we just talked about, <laughs> and spawns so much, uh, example, the computer, it will be the legacy come the apocalypse. Uh, great <laughs> session, everyone. Um, and then Ruth has a question. I'm curious about how your students get access to jacquard looms after leaving school and how uh, many people are using the AVL or an AVL. I have an AVL, she says. Ruth says. Kate, I know, I know you've used, you've utilized some of the, um, like there's Wovens and Weft and some of those mm-hmm. weave, weave on demand programs. And like that, that's not a way that student can come, come actually weave it, but it, you could actually weave your jacquard ideas so, or how it gets woven by an industrial loom. That's one way. And I do know some programs will, do they open it up to some of their graduates after? I, I don't, I don't, it is, it's a hard, it's like such a specific thing because they have to be so cared for, but Hopefully that will change. The TC2 is a little bit more affordable than a TC1. So I think more individuals are buying them and they're becoming a little bit more accessible. Yeah. But it, I mean, that that is a challenge. I mean, I I definitely faced that after, it's like being suspended in space after you yeah. leave the institution and you don't have access to this 
tool that was you were relying on so much. So yeah, hopefully these workshop spaces and you know textile centers will continue to grow. Yeah. And you're asking who uses AVL. Do you I guess it the AVL I know does have a thread control option too. And I've never used one of those, but I, we, at the College of Textiles we use we have AVL Dobbies. So we use WePoint on those. And you and you guys have some some um AVLs too at, at ECU. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't um I personally I weave on a um I have a Patronic B60, which is an arm loom. It's similar to an AVL. Um and, and that's what I weave on in my at home. Um, you know, I don't have my own TC2. <laughs> Wish I did, but I don't. I know. <laughs> um yeah, so there, folks, if you haven't seen uh, the question and answer box, go ahead and pop that open and pull up the chat as well. We have just a couple minutes left. Um, a handful of uh, attendees have added some really good links or just information about these other pop-up things. I don't want to call them pop-up because they're not necessarily temporary, but these, these places that are popping up outside of um, universities, et cetera, that have access um, one is a college, uh, community college, I think, where was it, in Toronto or Montreal, um, Quebec City, and then uh, a couple other things. So make sure you check that out. Um, we have one last question maybe here. Thank you, everybody, for sharing your amazing work. A question for you all. How beneficial do you feel your MFA program was to your practice? What kind of advice would you give to somebody who wants to further their practice but is conflicted about whether it would be worth it to attend a textiles grad program? I just had this conversation with uh, one of my undergrads and uh, my MFA program completely changed my practice. Um, and I think that it's, you know, I, I think that an MFA going to a, a school that has an MFA program, especially, you know, in weaving or textiles, if that's the path you want to take, it's, 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 a great it's going to open doors for you yeah. um and it's going to make you push your practice push your concept it makes you um you know and it's not you know you don't you don't go to an mfa program and and not have it and not interact with people in other areas you're you're getting exposure to so many different professors artists um and that creative community that happens in the classroom um that it, it's it's it will elevate your work um, exponentially, and I and I and I am and I know you know it's it's a hard thing because of financial and thinking about that. But um, you know you really have to make a choice. If I would never be, I mean obviously I wouldn't be where I am today without going to the and I'm, you know getting my MFA. But but my program was just incredible. Um, I'll give a shout out to Kent State University. That was my <laughs> <laughs> but um, Robin, you yeah. better shout out ECU. We got a program. Come to us too. And we and we do. <laughs> Kent State we do. Too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Gabe. Right. Um, right. And and we have a um, right. We have a program and and our and a TC two and a half of a TC one or something. <laughs> and a great right, great facilities. Great. Um, yeah. So, and great artists. Our, our, I mean, our, our faculty at ECU is, is, they're quite incredible. It's some of the best artists I've ever worked with. So. I was going to say for an MFA, um, definitely try to go to a place that you'll get a different experience from your undergrad too. You know, like, you know, I mean, you, everyone has a different experience too. Like if you, if you want to stay where you are, that that's good. But, you know, it's, I think try to think of broader, getting the most out of the experience too. So, you know, like, Go where you can meet some new teachers, get a new, uh, learn about a new type of working process, and learn some new technology. Kind of, kind of think about how to maximize that experience too, um, on top of learning how to to work for yourself. And kind of like, I think just really try to think about um, just broadening that experience for yourself and maximizing it to, as in many ways as possible. Um, and I think it's funny over time too, like because. When I graduated from undergrad, there was they were just touching on, they were just beginning to touch on the computerized weaving, but it was like this was like 2002, so it was like 
we didn't quite understand it yet. And I wanted to learn more technical weaving. So I went to a school that could give me more technical things, you know? So it's like, but that was nowadays, that might not be the case for the school I was at. It's because like, I think depending, there's going to be these technologies changing all the time. So think of something different that you can get wherever, whatever school you're at. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. but we are in different times too. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's so critical and it's, you know, for all of us, I think it was definitely life-changing and really built the foundation of my studio practice that I continue to work with, um, you know, the same ideas. I'm still in conversation with my advisors who are now some of my closest friends. Um, but it, it is the real, the financial piece is yeah. hard. And I have a lot of friends that have gone through MFA programs and just, you know, afterwards are kind of it's not a pre-professional degree. So you have to, there's ways to be clever, I think, to minimize the debt, you know, to look at grants that are outside of the field of arts. You know, there's a lot of women's grants, career change grants, um, but it's something to take into account when you're making the decision. But financial piece aside, I think it is absolutely critical in, you know, advancing your art practice and and developing a network of other with fellow artists. Yeah, I don't think there, I have there's much. ways to do it outside of it too. I would say if you can't, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I feel kind of mixed on it. I don't feel like I have much to add. Um, it, things are definitely strained right now for a lot of people and um, lots of unknowns. But if you have the opportunity to do it, like you should definitely do it. I definitely second. Um, I think Janie was saying make sure you get somewhere different from your undergrad and you know just. Uh, see what else is out there um, in general. Um, but if you have an opportunity to do it, I don't know, that's just such an incredible opportunity. Or if you, like Kate was saying, if you can find ways to do it, which you can, um, could be really, it definitely does challenge you. It, it will push you into a whole new evolutionary stage. Crazy things happen in grad school and you learn a lot through it. <laughs> Um, okay, I think we are perfectly timed to hang up on everybody right now. I don't know how to do it. Um, <laughs> thank, thank, it yeah, yeah, thank you all so much. Um, get get back on that app and check whatever is going on on the TC, TSA website. Um, I was at TC, TC whatever. <laughs> Um, and so I'm so excited to be seeing what else is happening this weekend. Um, wow. Uh, go 2020. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you, everybody. Hang us up somehow. Yes, vote. Yes. <laughs> yes.